just want to touch base on the situation. Thank you very much. I have mixed feelings about it. Your drinking is really not healthy. Right, and, and you don't want to be an enabler. This will not be the toughest ethical well, question Woken fight. <laughs> Mayor Vishner was an original member of the notorious Yippies. The, Yippies the radical youth movement of the 1960s. Yeah, he hung out with Jimi Hendrix and John Lennon. My job was to produce the demonstrations. Mayor did a lot of the work and never got any of the credit. I wasn't just hanging out with giants. I was helping them be giants. Mayor was trying to start a revolution. Decades later, here he is. Well, do you want to show me around a little bit? OK. This chair has my pants. This is my Fakata computer. That, I have no idea what's in it. I've never opened it since 1974. I'm trying to figure out what happened to Mayer in all those years since the 60s. I'm uh, dying of loneliness. I'm dying of lack of human contact. And my life is totally out of control. And it's time to go. Who do you think he wants help from him? Do you think he wants help from you, or...? I don't know. I, I just can't stay behind the camera and watch him kill himself. I have found out more times than I want to have learned the lesson. Nobody gets saved unless they want to be saved. Mayor says, I'm tired, I'm done, I got nothing left. I believe that he's tired. I don't believe that he has nothing left to offer. My decision is consistent with a lifelong quest to have agency. I continue filming because I started filming, because I care about him. And as a filmmaker, it's the one true thing I can do. That's it, isn't it? That's all I had with me. They created a beautiful film here. We're going to discuss it. It's a lot to talk about. Thank you. Well. We get right into it. Welcome, guys. Um, I mean, Mayor Vishner, how'd you first come upon this guy's story? Obviously, he's an amazing character. How'd you first come upon him? You know, I had made another film um, called No Impact Man, and Mayor had been in that. And I grew up in New York in the 70s and 80s, interested in activism and kind of um, looking back at the 60s with a certain longing, because in the 80s, it wasn't cool to be an activist. and uh, so when I met Mayer and I heard about his history, I really wanted to know more. So I decided to make a little film about him, a profile of this kind of aging activist living in New York, struggling a little bit, but uh, I had no idea what, what it was leading to. Yeah, and Dave, how did you get pulled into this process? Well, Justin and I worked together uh, for about 10 years before that, and so, um, you know, we were, he, he discovered that the guy and and we would chat about it and then after after a while we decided to 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 make make the film together yeah i mean i um shot the film over the course of four years mm -hmm. and kind of it became very close to mayor and to the material and uh it was great having dave there to to have a different perspective how many times did this thing change over the course of, of that filming process? I mean, you started off as a short, I believe, and then it became a full, and then you were trying to think about shortening it up. I mean, tell me a little bit about yeah. that process. You know, uh, as I said, I was just wanted to make a film about, about this amazing New York character. Uh, and then about six months in, he told me that he was thinking about his taking his own life. Mm -hmm. And immediately I had to stop and try to think about whether this was something I could continue, um, you know, whether it would be good for him. I didn't, I certainly didn't want to contribute to his death. Um, so I spoke to his doctors and I spoke to his friends and they all felt that making a film might be a good thing for him. Um, but at that point, I kind of stepped through the, the lens and uh, became part of the film. I decided that if I was going to make this film, it had to be about our, our friendship. Mm -hmm. And he really became you know, part of my family. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Dave, yeah, what do you think about this evolution? Uh, well, I think that it's interesting. I think that um, during the course of those years, I think there were a lot of perhaps you could call them false alarms uh, 
and it was unclear what Mayer's real motivation was. And so when I started working on the project, he was still alive, and um, uh, it seemed like he might be more serious, but we were unsure, and even um, as time went on, we, we didn't know whether there was gonna be, what, what the ending might be to the film. So um, it was interesting. Yeah, I mean, Justin, I mean, I'm sure as a documentarian, you're faced with the idea of someone changing their motives or changing the narrative and not getting involved. I mean, this is, but this is a completely different thing. This is a person thinking about taking his own life. I mean, how do you deal with being behind the lens and then being part of the story and where you could draw the line as far as filmmaker and trying to create a great product for him as well, but also trying to steer him away from sure. your thoughts, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, you're right. I, I've been making films for a long time, and, and even the most kind of benign film has a lot of underlying ethical questions about the relationship between the filmmaker and the subject. What's, what's their motive? You know, is there any coercion involved? Are you taking advantage of your subject? And, but when something like this happened, you know, it, the stakes were just completely different and, and higher. And um, so it really uh, became part of the story. Mm. Would the film, you know, keep him alive? And, you know, for a long time I felt that it was keeping him alive in that um, he was really living, this was one of the things that he really lived for. Um, and then I also worried, you know, would he feel a certain um, need to give the film a, a dramatic ending. Uh, so it, it, it was really intense. Um, but, you know, it's an issue that so many people go through. Forget about the filmmaking. You know, you have somebody in your life that's miserable or dealing with mental illness or addiction. I mean, how do you help them? How can you, can you save them? I and mean, at first I, I thought, oh, I, you know, I can be there for him and show him how valuable he is. Um, but uh, it's difficult, and so often people are reluctant to talk about their experiences. Um, yeah. I mean, Dave, I mean, how are you dealing with this? I mean, you're co-directing this film, you're a part of this process as well, and you have your collaborator who's very much involved with the narrative of this subject. I mean, how are you sort of balanced? Do you find yourself required to sound off when you think it's getting to a point where it's, uh, you know? I, I think yeah. that was definitely my role, I think. Um, to keep perspective, to try to tell the story in a way that was true to the story without being either self-indulgent or um, uh, too sort of emotionally um, kind of torn up about it. Um, but it was really, you know, there was a lot, there was a lot of time that they spent together and there's a lot of footage and that was going in all sorts of directions and it was really about distilling sort of the, the core of the story, the themes that Justin just mentioned, and as well as this, theme about aging that I think is really um, crucial in our, in our society right now and, and, and what people go through and what we take for granted and trying to kind of really focus on those things and also trying to keep Justin in mind as sort of a character. Mm -hmm. And in a way for me, it was really about who are the characters in this movie and how do we tell a story that's both gonna be true but also engaging and it's going to build with all the sort of great storytelling things that you, you want. Um, and I think it, it was about sort of finding those moments in the footage, and for me at least, and, and trying to have them rise to the top because there were so many and there was so much time that they had spent together on film. Yeah, I mean, because when you come down to it, when you get to the edit room, you have to tell a good story, a story that people will want to watch. Um, that's, I mean, Mayor was, very funny at times, and but there was a lot of sadness, and you had to, you know, pick and choose. So that, um, I mean, how do you tell a story about a guy sitting in his underwear? <laughs> um, kind of, but he had this glorious and impactful youth, um, and now more than ever, we need, you know, people like him who are, you know, willing to, um, you know, devote their lives to what they think is is justice. Um, so. Uh, you know, it was, it was, unfortunately, you know, the depression got the best of him. Yeah. 
I mean, one of the most powerful moments for me in the film is when you're having the discussion about the camera that you've placed in his room, um, you know, that's sort of used as a time lapse and to catch certain actions of him. And then you became worried that it was just going to be a, a, a lens for him to show what he was going to do to himself to commit suicide on it. I mean, what were those, were you battling with that decision? Was that something that you were worried about constantly? I can imagine that kept you up at night almost. Well, it, you know, I certainly didn't w want mayor to end his life and I certainly didn't want to participate or be a um, an impetus for that so when it became clear that the camera we put a camera in his house because he was constantly saying that he was dying of loneliness but when I was there he was animated and as charming as ever so I wanted to see what it was like you know he spent days by himself in his house mm. but then it became clear that he wanted to document his death mm. and I was not comfortable with that I, you know, if he wanted to do it, you know, he could go get his own camera and do it, but mm. I wasn't going to participate. So when I told him I was taking it down, he got very angry, mm. um, which only proved to me that, it, yes, it was contributing to his, his plans. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was a constant uh, struggle, I mean, between us, because, you know, Mayer was a yippie, um, and, I, I mean... It would be great if this film kind of rekindled an interest in the Yippies. They were the anti-war protesters in the late 60s, uh, but they used humor and sarcasm and theater to kind of show the absurdity of what was going on. Yeah. Um, and they had a big impact on what activists do today. Um, but they believed in spectacle. Mm -hmm. And even in his you know, dying days and his depression, he saw this as an opportunity mm -hmm. to uh, make a statement and, uh, you know, I believe in his rights to make a statement, but I didn't want to uh, be the vehicle for that. So, um, or at least for his, for his death. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I don't want to be all morose here because he is an amazing character. He's so funny, you know, he's obviously smart, um, obviously impassioned with his uh, protesting and his activism. Um, tell me a little bit about those discussions you had with him initially, like where, how you wanted the film to be originally. As you said about the Yippies, um, you know, he's a person who's just walking around New York City. I think we see a lot of those here in the city and you're wondering, what's that guy's story? What's that guy's story? He has an amazing story. So how did you first see this film? How did you first imagine it being like? Yeah, I mean, I saw, uh, I mean, he clearly was f fading. He was not engaged so much anymore in politics, um, but you know, when I went back and I saw these pictures of him as a young man, you know, at Abby Hoffman's side, um, you know, with Paul Krasner and these guys that really kind of changed the direction of, uh, of the country um, and heard these stories about how he kind of advised them. Mm. Uh, I was just, you know, really excited to hear, you know, how that happened and um, to try to understand why he was kind of s sitting alone. Um, but I had no idea uh, of the extent that, uh, you know, of sadness that he felt. Mm. Um, so, but his house had, you know, layer upon layer of stuff. And, you know, underneath it was some really, you know, beautiful and valuable and amazing posters and T-shirts, his T-shirt collection, mm. which I, is now in my basement. I mean, like some of the first political T-shirts there are from the, from the mid-60s, yeah. Dave, yeah, did, were you very aware of the, the Yippie movement before, and then how did, how did it reveal his part of this process to you, you know? I mean, I'd never heard of Mayer, certainly, and um, I think that's part of what's interesting about the story, and I feel like why Mayer felt overlooked uh, from the beginning. I think that he was a big part of that movement, but, you know... Uh, you see him in the photos next to the founders always. of that movement, absolutely. But you, know, you hear Abby Hoffman, you don't hear Mayor Vishner. Um, and uh, so it was, it was great for me to dive into that history. I mean, I certainly studied it to some extent, but I, I, didn't, I didn't know nearly as much as I know now. Um, so it was, uh, it was interesting. And it was interesting um, because I think even looking at the early footage, you know, you can tell that Mayor has so much to offer and Justin's so interested in, in him, yet there's always something nagging, unspoken, and, you know, even like in the first shoot when they go to a protest that doesn't even make it into the film, there's something off, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, and, I mean, an amazing thing about 
mayor and his his cohorts is, I mean, sadly, quite a few of them took their own lives. Um, I mean, Abby Hoffman did. Mayor was very close with Phil Oakes, who was kind of the the, the musical voice of the movement. Um, I mean, quite a few. And, you know, I think there is this concept uh, called suicide contagion, which is when somebody in your life does that, makes that decision, it kind of opens the possibility. And, you know, it's a real issue today. Uh, the men mayor's age, the suicide rate is almost doubled in the past 10 years. Um, and it needs to be discussed and dealt with as a kind of a real health problem. Mm. And, um, you know, I feel like in some way mayor donated his sadness as a way to, to bring this up and to discuss it. And when I show the film, people come up to me who have gone through in my position as a friend, a loved one, yeah. um, really grateful that they get to talk about it and that this is out there. Yeah, and, and you see in the beginning of, of the film, he's he's obviously heavily self-medicating with alcohol. I mean, that's another quandary that you face. You, you open the film a little bit about a, a little bit of, um, uh, I guess, uh, your inter-controversy versus um, delivering alcohol to this man who's obviously, it's. You're worried about enabling him. Yeah, it's I mean, not what cool was that? to, yeah. to, to uh, you know, as a as a friend to enable somebody, and as a filmmaker, you know, I didn't. If I was gonna, he called me and said, "If you're coming over, bring me some beer," and I was like, "Well, if I'm gonna do that, then I want to film it, and I want I want a, you to pay me back on camera, and, and let's talk about it." Mm. Um, and that's when he had this <laughs> amazing line that the film opens with, which is, you know, if you think that's an ethical problem, you know. Just wait and see what happens, because mm. he knew where he wanted to take this, and I had no idea. Mm. Um, so it was a little kind of uh, uh, foreshadowing. Yeah, I mean, like you said, so he, it seems like he knew where he wanted to take this, and and you found yourself deeper and deeply uh, involved with his story, and to the point where your family is getting involved. Obviously, your your wife comes into play, you know, because she's obviously concerned about the amount of time and his intentions. I mean, tell me a little bit about bringing them into the storyline and obviously painting that picture. Yeah, well, um, I mean, as a friend, uh, it was important to me to uh, to have, I brought him into my family to know that that I was serious about caring for him. And the way that he, the way that he kind of treated my son, he brought him to his garden, Mayor was a big gardener, and taught him how to plant garlic and... Um, I mean, which was really, you know, saw, you see a different side of me, a really loving, touching side. Um, and my wife was very supportive of the project, but after four years <laughs> uh, of filming with him, she was like, listen, we gotta, we gotta find an end. Can you describe a little bit about what that process was like for you guys? I mean, were you getting a text? Were you getting a call in the middle of the night? I mean, how was he sort of setting up his interview process? You know, it, in, it ebbs and flows. You know, there are times when he when he was very um, much in touch, and then if I there's a point in the movie where I had my, my second child was born, and um, I had to go and be with my family, and he would call me up feeling very jealous. You know, and at one point, uh, you know, he threatens to take his life, and you could say that that was his way of looking for attention. Uh, you know. Um, so uh, there were moments where he's really engaged, and then there were moments where you know he was very angry with me for not being there for him. At one point, I suggested we make a short film, and he just went crazy, you know. Um, so uh, it was it was a wrestling match. Um, I mean, I don't have any regrets about it. I really feel like uh, uh, I did the best I could as a friend and as a filmmaker. Um, and you obviously you do one-on-one -on -one interviews with his physician, um, or you're in the room while he's talking to his physician. Was that something that was uh, that had to be discussed before? I'm sure. And was a physician always comfortable with you sitting in on those sessions? Yeah, I was there with his m medical physician, who um, Dr. Schiller, who had known Mayer for a decade. And I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why I decided to move forward making the film was that I was allowed in that room. Mayer was asking him for help to end his life, um, and, and Dr. Schiller was brave enough to allow me to, to be there to document that process. 
um, and he was trying to figure out how to help Mayer. And likewise, I spent quite a bit of time filming Mayer's therapy. Um, you know, these doctors were, were uh, saw the value in Mayer's and the project, um, and, uh, and that helped me to feel more comfortable. I was not alone with this information. Mm. And Dave, having that outside eye, what were you able to sort of voice that you were, I'm sure you had to fill in some blanks. Hey, can we get a little more of this? Can you ask him about that? How'd that process go? I mean, there are definitely some conversations about that, but I think more, um, more so it was in really piecing together the film and figuring out how we were going to portray Justin as a character in the film and, and what, what his narration would be, sort of how you clock his development over time, um, especially when you need to do it, you know, you're condensing all this, all this time in there. So I think that we were able to, I think what I was able to do was to give some perspective because not only was he so emotionally involved with Mayer and so emotionally involved with the filmmaking and was spent all this time trying to help uh, to the point where, you know, he just knew that his heart was in the right place and was hoping for the best. Mm. Um, and so uh, I think it takes time for anybody to process a relationship like that, especially when it turns out the way it did. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you're trying to make a film about it while it's happening, it's probably that much harder. Yeah. And um, I think so, so I think we spent a lot of time, you know, writing back and forth, interviewing Justin, even, even on camera or even on, on tape, just to see like what what how, how that might come out and yeah. you know and and lots of different different ways to sort of really get at what what where he was because I think it's hard to know when you're in the middle of it. And I'm sure you know to have a man who's so ingrained in activism at this time, as you were mentioning, this it's more important than ever. You kind of wonder what use he could have been, the message he could have shared about that time where we're using that those same sort of. Uh, initiatives right now? I mean, have you talked to his friends, his families from those days about it since? Yeah, I mean, you know, all of them say, you know, they wish Mayor were giving us advice. Um, and, uh, and you know, what would Mayor do? I, I think about it. Um, how do you get the attention of the world to um, express yourself about what you see as, as injustice? Um, but, uh, yeah, and there's still some, you know, some of his comrades going strong um, and uh, working hard. That's amazing. Okay, well, I guess we have some questions out in the audience, so start right there. Hi, um, thank you for bringing this very difficult work. It, it seems that it's a testament to um, how resilient and fragile we all are. Um, was there a place that was definable in his life where it looked like he went off the rails, or was it a gradual loss of, of... Yeah, that's a great question. And that's part of what I was looking for in the film. You know, I go back and look at pictures and f movies, home movies, and talk to his friends. Um, you know, I think he had suffered from depression all his life, but when he was younger, he had this movement that was so much of a community and really a family for him that um, gave him purpose and gave him hope, and they thought they were going to change the world. Um, and you know, in the early '70s, when Nixon was elected, and the kind of movement started to fracture, and drugs, you know, harder drugs took over on the scene. I think he had less um, focus and less um, inspiration, and less he felt he had less to give. So, uh, you know, that's when he started drinking, and certainly that didn't help. Um, yeah. Thank you for the question. Good question. Yeah, it's right here. With this film, I'm wondering, what do you hope is the message people take away from Mayor's life? That's a great question. I mean, I didn't, uh, we didn't start out, and we certainly, I don't think we wanted to make an advocacy film. Um, it was really a film to show an experience um, I think it's about the need for community, um, the need for, uh, you know, as Dave said, there's this gray wave that's coming where our population of people over 60 is doubling. Um, 
that we need to take care of them and, and, and find a, a support system for them so they can feel um, engaged. Uh, but equally, I think it's important that the film provides a, a, a way for people to discuss depression and suicide and um, what it's like to be a survivor um, of somebody that you loved who took their life. And, um, you know, there's a lot of guilt and there's a lot of uh, difficult feelings. And to be able to not feel ashamed about it and talk about it, I think, is really important. I also think that Mayor is someone that you might walk by on the street and not even notice. And I think that it's about acknowledging, looking at your own life and thinking about your own life and who's in your life and what your life means and how you how you need to make sure that you're taking care of the people in your life. I think um, I think that's an important message of the film as well. Absolutely. Uh, one last question right there. Hey, um, so I was wondering um, if do you feel like if he did feel like if he had a purpose um, even now, like especially with what's going on, do you think he would have uh, wanted to continue or had changed his mind at some point? I mean, that's, that's the question, whether, you know, it, it, with the events going on now, whether he would be more engaged and have more of a purpose. Um, I think it's a tough question to ask. And I think, uh, you know, at the time, I, I dragged him out of his house to the Occupy movement, um, hoping that, because I felt like he could really teach. And while he was heartened by it, he also felt that he needed to pass the baton and didn't feel... Um, you know, his glass was half empty always, and that's, you know, the darkness of depression. Um, so it's impossible to say. Um, you know, I feel that he had a lot to give, and it would be great if he were contributing now. Um, but it's, you know, it's not fair to uh, second guess. You can't. It's, you'll, you'll drive yourself nuts. Well, guys, Left, or Pur Left on Purpose is amazing, uh, amazing profile of a very interesting man. I recommend everybody check it out on iTunes and Amazon this Friday, correct? Correct, yeah. There we go, on Google Play. Thanks so much. One more hand, a round of applause for Raja. <laughs> and Dave.